Da 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 it starts at Clark Doesn't Know History Live, and it's the Battle of Agate, Agitis Island. Yes, I know. How are we all doing? How is everything? First of all, we have to open up a bottle of iron, bro. It's been one of those Secondly, apologies for the timing we've met, we've back and forth, but uh, I was walking dogs, and I thought it was going to take longer than it did. And so on my phone, I quickly went, right then, if I'm going to be trapped here, um, I haven't planned for this, but I'll move it back half hour. It's going to be okay, because then we'll be upset too much. There was actually an interesting point where someone said, they, obviously he was plan intending a long patrol. I was actually thinking about doing a long patrol about ship design in this period. But I thought I would save it for the long patrol, which comes out on Saturday, on this, of this part, of this part. I'm also going to start off by explaining something, uh, which is always a good heads up before I say hello to everyone. There is a couple of people who've been commenting recently going, well, why are you doing these sort of things? These aren't your area of history. Well, as people who've watched the channel for a long time will know, me and Roman history are very, very good friends. And if I hadn't been a naval historian, I'd have been a Roman historian. Secondly, the joy of being a naval historian is that if you go and teach in most universities, you end up teaching Age of Sail. If you go and teach, if you teach on certain courses at King's, you can end up teaching from the Greco-Roman period forward. And Admiral, Admiral Zheng He, Admiral Zi, all these people, I have taught. Because I have to. Because... Okay, in terms of publication, would I go and write a book on the Roman Navy? No, I would leave that to the wonderful, immutable Simon Elliot, who is far, far better than me. But would I teach a seminar on it? Yes. Without any to any worry, because I've done that before countless times. Would I teach a lecture on it as part if it was a one-off lecture as part of a broader course? Yes, because some of these battles have good strategic experience and things that have to be taught. Would I teach an entire module entitled the Roman Navy? No. But this is the point about being a university lecturer. It's, to an extent, a skill set, because, yes, my passion and what I write on might be mainly the 1920s and 30s and the Royal Navy and the other modern navies of that period, and the journal articles I might have published might be about aircraft carriers, they might be about destroyers, they might be about aircraft development by the three major navies but i don't you don't have the luxury in the departments of having hundreds upon hundreds of staff that you are able to call upon to come and fill in for individual lectures when you're teaching a module you teach the module so you have to go and learn and you have to get be capable of it so you learn which books how to assess books quite quickly how to assess what books to know and this is important because this then explains where I get the knowledge from and the ability to do this teaching and do these topics. It comes from reading the books. It comes from going and doing my due diligence, doing my study, and going and going through the stuff. And they're also a lot of fun. They are a lot of fun for me to do, and that's why I do them. Anyway, so that's the explain explanation for anyone who's worrying in the comments. I've replied to a couple of you in the comments, but what I'd start off by explaining it to begin with. This is why I do this. And I often do share things with some of the people involved. And in fact, in terms of the slides today, some of the pictures actually come from the wonderful, immutable, amazing Simon, uh, Simon Elliott has sent me some of the ship pictures and advice on what to say. Because I was chatting to him, explaining what I was going to say, and he agreed with it. But he said, "Add in this, add in this, and this." So that's what we do. Right, hello, Night Six Eight Three One. Hello, John Shay. 
Hello, Colin with Gazwag. Hello, Robin Cash. Hello, Jack Ray. Hello, John. Sh hello, John Shea again. Dan Freeman. Hello. Hello, Yieldy Sage. Hello, Vision. Mm hmm. Snow yesterday, snow tomorrow, melt today. Fun times. <laughs> I'm worried about the number of people getting quite so obsessed with the Blackburn block. I'm believe that's one side. And hello, Jack. Hello, Wayne Boring. Hello, Dunrick and Hammer. Hello, Jack Ray. Hello, I think I already said that one. Uh, hello, Bishop. That's good. Hello, Avzaski. Hello, Cal Hanshaw. Hello. N nursing a broken rib. Ouch. <sighs> no, Tyrant. Never heard this battle. Uh, unleash the fleet of puns. There is some. There is no your area in history. Not in my world. Uh, not in terms of being a naval historian. There's not usually enough of us in a university department to actually have be able to have a teaching area that we focus on. We just do this one period of history. Really? Uh, well, that means your other three colleagues are going to be teaching all the other modules without you. In which case, they are either going to start hunting you down and hurting you. Or they are going to take it to decide you are not on a full time member of staff. And actually, what I would like to say is this is part of a series of Roman battles I'm planning on doing, you know, over the next couple of years, probably. I've worked, I've fleshed them out. And the next one, which is going to be in May, is the Battle of. Check which one battle I did choose. Yeah. The Battle of Cape Economus. Economus? Uh, which is the largest battle in history. And when I say the largest battle in history, the Roman fleet involved was 140,000 personnel. The Carthaginian fleet involved was 150,000 personnel. So a total of 290,000 people engaged in the fight at sea. It is... Uh, there are a few Chinese battles which come close to it in terms of records, but it is the largest battle in terms of personnel ever. And you have up to 50,000 killed or captured between two sides. It's humongous. So, there you go. That's, a That's coming up in May. This... This is the battle which in many ways decides the fate of the First Punic War. This is the battle which matters that much. And it, uh, the reason I'm doing it first is because it's a good way to introduce the ships to use. Because it's quite important because the fleet that actually fights this battle, well, it basically, it's built by the Roman Senate going to every one of Rome's wealthiest citizens and asking them for each to give a loan to finance the construction of one ship, which would be repayable by reparations to be imposed on Carthage once the war was, owned, uh, war was won, and to donate slaves as oarsmen. Now, here's the point, and I'm going to get into this quite quickly. People then go, oh, so they were using slaves as oarsmen. That's not usually a good idea. Let's put it this way. Having, sla having your oarsmen be slaves just gives you a la rather large number of people aboard who want to kill you as well as the, enem and the enemy coming at them. So, what my suggestion from reading it, from the reading of sources, and some, some do believe they were slaves, but some are more on the inclined belief that instead of them being slaves, they were freed on condition that they served as oarsmen. So basically, they donate the slaves, and then the slaves are made freemen in order to serve as oarsmen in the ships. Basically, the idea, the idea is, you're free, but only as long as you do go and do that sailing. And then you can, after the war's over, you can go free and do what you like. It's an easier way to motivate them than keep threatening to hurt them. Besides, the kind of the complicated training skill sets, etc., you need to be a good oarsman on these ships 
means that it's just not an option to really use a slight as someone motivated entirely by fear. Because in nice way the odds are they're gonna get killed or they could get killed by the enemy. So again, fear motivation not a good tool. Our own cash? Let's see. Ooh. Tharakam, because when we get the historian title, we pick one topic and then never leave it under the pain of death. Oh, I, uh, that would be so boring. And so anyway, I have to write my bachelor thesis. I have no idea how you can write a whole book academically. I'm not doing a master's because I don't want to write a master's thesis. Okay, also, because I want to earn real money now. Yeah, I can understand that. Opinion on the Roman galley scenes in Ben-Hur. Well, that's this is the trouble. We we look at Ben Hur and these movies, and they and they do think because they talk about slaves being given to be oarsmen, people often then go they must have main, maintained the slaves, and possibly there are some slaves used at times as oarsmen, but it's very rare because when you consider the sheer amount of them. Also, here is the other thing: you are carrying marines aboard your ship to act as boarders, right? There's the main way the battle of the Romans especially fought before this battle was to use the Corvus, which was basically a bridge which came down, stampede across that onto the other ship, and fight it out. Now, you can only do that if your marines aren't needed on your ship to watch slaves, because if in the fighting the slaves get up and start revolting, you're in trouble. You go, oh, well, we chain them to the ship. Well, that's going to reduce their range of movement and all the things they need to do for oaring. And it's a complicated procedure because, believe it or not, it's not easy rowing something which has this many tiers of oars. So that comes in. Also, I'd point out that that was mostly done in the period when they were belie still believing that the pyramids were entirely built by slave labor, when it's highly, now considered highly improbable. More like sort of an indentured form of labour, not slave labour. Again, kind of like the Romans were doing with the oarsmen, because you basically took slaves, you went, oh, you're slaves, but we're going to free you as long as you serve as oarsmen until the campaign or the war's over. In which case you go, so I get my freedom back. Mm, yeah. Hello, Malaga. Hope all is well in my world. Yes, most well. There's a Foxo. Hello, Seneca Nero. I have got a really good question for the brew ships, but I don't want to ask it here because it might drive you mad. Hmm, that's good. Hello, Adrian Spidon. Uh, I was asking. Made six acres, so it makes Jutland like a picnic. It makes Jutland a little, little small. Hello, Richard. Dick Richard. Got my notification. I know this might be a spoiler, but is this battle that, uh, it, but is this the battle that ended, and then the victorious fleet was sunk in the Halsey-esque storm? Not quite. There are a few like that, though. That's what. If the other side is saying they'll free the slaves, the oarsmen, they don't want to kill the other side. Only you. Yeah. Um, Dunghash, do you think the uh, slaves were a much higher percentage of battles in this era due to armored men and no life or boats on flotation devices? It's certainly an issue. Uh, let's put it this way. So, and before I get into this particular slide, I'm going to do this. Some of you, if you go to the gym, will wear one of these. I do. It weighs in at, my one, 20 kilograms. It's good for building stamina, Endurance, all those sort of things, right? This is not far off the weight you would be looking at in terms of the body armor. So imagine going for a swim wearing that. It's fun. I have to say, I do sometimes call this my iron corset, but we'll leave that to one side. Ah. Bam again. Oh. Oh, you caramba. Yep, the weight vest. 
So, um, also, um, I'm going to just go through this quite quickly. Rome existed, but I, 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 I uh, it, it's, I, I'm not sure where this idea started, but it did exist, um, in the nicest way. No one is smart enough to put it on as a conspiracy theory. There are ser the sheer amount of people who would have to be involved in that. It it's kind of like the law of big secrets. Uh the more people you have involved a secret who know a secret, the less likely it is to stay true as a, a secret. Well, for Rome to be a conspiracy theory, you would have had to do so so much. Um, and Carthage, or oh, there is also some people who claim that Carthage didn't exist. Uh, it was founded by Phoenicians, who were a facilocratic, uh, facilocratic state in the Levant region. And that means they're basically a mercantile marine state. And at one point, the Carthaginians were basically referred to as the Western Phoenician Empire. Or words to that effect. Um, please note the events we're talking about are 2,263 years ago today. We don't have many dates for battles in terms of the dates. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I put the Battle of Echnos, Echnos uh, when, in, when I put it. But we do actually have a date for this battle, which is it's supposed to take place on the 10th of March. So... Yeah, it may, it may or may not have. But let's be honest, it's 2,263 years ago. Uh, the odds of that being accurate are... But um, it's still roughly there on this day. So it's quite good. Tim Lucas, hello. Side of topic, are there any good books on the Byzantium Navy besides Priors, the Age of Dormant Dormant? Not really at the moment. Uh, there are some being written. I do know, because this is one of the great things, again, being friends with Simon Elliott, and I'll, we've got to get him back on uh, Bill Trump at some point. Um, you do talk. Uh, I do talk with him, and I talk with others who do specialise in these things, and there is stuff being written. There are a few good journal articles that have come out recently, so I'm hoping they're going to be turned into books. That's good. I'm not sure there's any contemporary source saying so, but if there were, I guess the desperation, like throwing open the doors of the armory to the public in a siege. Hmm. I suffered. Um, Seneca, how to find Roman stuff in my area? Dig down. <laughs> yeah, well, this is the point. This is, I, I come from the UK, as you all can guess from the accent and the affiliation to Iron Brew, and the train above my head. Uh, but the fact is, in where I live, you can wander around and find Roman architecture and Roman construction quite easily. But, um, yes. There are people all around the world, and they, some of them have opinions, which are interesting. Hi, Stephen Richards. Don't worry. Dirk Richards. Rome was one of the four worldwide civilizations mentioned in the Bible. If anything, it was larger, uh, far, a far larger empire than history tells us. We are seeing history events edited out of, out of the reality live time. Hmm. We're seeing things definitely interesting. <laughs> Finland ruled Rome. That'd be fun. Then politics. Imagine arming any volunteer you can find in 2022. I can understand the desperation which goes through that man uh, that manoeuvre. I can understand why. Right, um, update on the Hyder uh, trip. We're sorting things through. They're being booked. Um, thank you very much for everyone's donations. Um, as I said, the ones at definite cover are Sackville, Hyder, the Warplane Heritage Museum, and the Nova Scotia Archives, the National M Museum of the Atlantic. And I'm also hoping if to get enough money, if I can swing it somehow, I'm doing extra work and all sorts of things, so which is why I'm not sleeping that much money, uh, to um, try and put in Little Rock and the Sullivans. 
because and I have to also work out if I need to sort out anything special to go across the border to Buffalo from Canada because literally we're just literally wandering into Buffalo for the day. But we'd have to probably add on a day onto the trip, um, which I know Dan Freeman wouldn't mind. Brack, I might have to bribe with suitable restaurant quality food. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be quite cool to add them on. And uh, if I can add the submarine in Port Burwell onto it as well, I'll be really, really happy. And then we'll have done five ships in thing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Bishon, I want to see a Dr. Clark Roman field trip. Actually, if you want to see a good field trip at the moment, Simon Elliott is tweeting his trip around North Africa and all the stuff he's going to see in North Africa. It's really worth following if you're interested. And I am absolutely massively jealous of not, be, of, um, not being able to go with him. I would have loved to it. Hmm. Hey, Richard. In regards to looking out, look at the Charles Atlas Bulwark uh, exercise machine. His training has absolutely changed my life. Training my body. Lost all the excess weight. Oh, well, I might have to look at that. Unfortunately, one of my employers is obsessed with BMI. And my ability to run a certain distance, etc. And wait, uh, thanks to BMI weight, so I have to keep a uh, watch on these fingers and do exercise. And constantly balance it against history stuff. Then, fellas, this is the history I study, and I never, never, never wanted to see it in real time. Yep, I think that's the motto of every single historian. We like to study our history, we don't like to witness it. <laughs> Run. Uh, I, I I can understand that, Dick, but honestly, I'm going to get past the twelve raw eggs now because I tried and I didn't like it. <laughs> Me and raw eggs were never going to get on. Anyway, it's all part of the first Punic War, and if we go back to this map earlier. This is what Carthage and Rome looked like before the Punic War begins. You can see a sliver of in, uh, of sort of semi-independent territories around Messina in north, well, northeastern Sicily. You can see the Syracusian state, which is the green bit, and then. Carthage, which is basically the coastline of North Africa, with the Numidians behind that. Remember, Carthage and the Empire are Phoenicians, but they also involve the local tribes as well. So you're looking at more of a quite a cultural uh, quite a cultural mix in that area. Carthage is quite a I wouldn't say multicultural society, as they're quite obsessed with enforcing the Carthaginian. Zari, but um, yeah, it, it, they are definitely involved. You also see that Corsica is Carthaginian on the coast. Sardinia is Carthaginian on the coast, and the Balearic Islands are completely dominated. That's because the Carthaginians don't like fighting in mountains, which is one of the reasons why the Romans are quite so surprised that when Hannibal does what he does in the Second Punic uh, Second uh, Car Punic War. As you can see, the battles are interesting. And if I start off with how it started, uh, in 264 BC, Carthage and Rome were the preeminent powers in the Western Mediterranean. This is not necessarily a cause of war. Um, they have had several alliances over their time. They had been quite good friends. They'd worked together, um, especially King Philip of um, one of the... Greek kings had had a lot of trouble, and actually, at several points, the Carthaginian fleet had been borrowed by the Romans to transport their troops. Yes, I did just tell you correctly. The Romans used to get a thumb for a lift off the Carthaginian fleet.
It's always fun when you do that. Go, please, can I have a lift? Yes. So they were actually more allies than they were anything else. Yeah. What's he done? But, in 289 BC, a group of mercenaries um, known as the Massentines. Uh, hang on, let me check I'm pronouncing that right. This is the trouble with occasionally reading off the screen. If I don't have the PowerPoint open on the other screen, because then I can see it while also checking on the egg split, occasionally I read things wrong. Uh, da, 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 da. The Mamertines, the Mamertines, not the Massatines, the Mamertines. Um, they, these actually, interesting enough, these mercenaries had been hired by the Syracusians to help them deal with some issues caused by the Carthaginians. However, they get upset, there's a dispute over pay, they retreat and take over Messina which the Syracusians sort of claim. The Syracusians then advance, and the Mamertines appeal to both Rome and Carthage for assistance. Now, this is where the problem arrives. Because if you look at where Massina is, you'll notice it's right next to the toe of Italy. If we go back to this earlier map, there's a very useful scrap of neutral ground there between Rome, Syracuse, and the Carthaginians, which allows everyone to be friendly, as no one is looking directly at them. And to be honest, the Romans don't give a flying hoot about Sicily when this begins. They really don't. Sicily is not worth it for them. Sicily just isn't worth it. <sighs> mm. It's a fun thing. And now once they get a course, the Carthaginians turn up first, but the Carthaginians are, don't, are, are sort of stopping the Syracusians besiege them. But then the Carthaginians get kicked out by the Massonites. Eventually the Romans decide to take part, saying that what they're going to do is they'll, they'll do it, and what they'll do is they'll get the any, again, the traditional thing of the Romans, if they do take part, anything, any war debt they incur will be made back by stuff off the enemy. And, um, which they didn't really have at this point, because they were technically, out, they were technically friends with Carthage at this point. But they do seem to get rather aggressive. They don't like the idea of Carthage being directly on their doorstep. And so the Romans turn up. The Carthaginian fleet isn't there and isn't able to interfere. And the Romans turn up, take home Messina, and the Syracusians back off, and then the Carthaginians back off and stop besieging the place. At which point, war starts. And honestly, the Carthaginians are sitting there thinking, war in Sicily, this is going to be long, it's going to take forever, and frankly, as long as we control the sea, it doesn't matter, and the Romans have a terribly weak navy. Ha ha ha, we're going to win this. So what starts the war, Knight 6031? Um, avarice, greed, and fear. And I know avarice and greed are basically the same things, but I'm going to say avarice in terms of wanting what other people have, greed in terms of wanting money, and fear of what happens if your next door neighbor is a major power. And this is the thing. The Carthaginians wanted it because it would give them a position from which they could influence the Romans. Yet didn't seem to realise that that same position would worry the Romans that they had it. So, 
But we also have a small problem, and I, I will admit this with the sources and, and as we talk about it. The Carthaginian written sources basically do not exist. Most of the stuff we have comes from various Greek histories, but most, uh, majoritively, comes from Polybus, who is a Roman historian, who did like to interview people. Uh, I'm not sure if I call him a historian or a diarist, but he did like to interview people who were involved and record the histories of what was going on, etc. And he's fairly analytical. He's quite interesting, and I, I do recommend reading his books if you can. Um, I have read sections in the original Latin, which was illuminating and part of how I learned Latin, um, because that was what we thought, how we thought at school. But the the English translation or the translation into your primary language is probably the easiest to go with. A good translation usually has the Latin on one page and the language of your choice on the other page. Um, those are quite. Those are books like that are worth their weight in gold because you can look at the see the translation and you can check out the Latin phraseology and sometimes they'll also give in little notes on the side in bold. This word can also be translated as this, this, this. So you can see what the variants come in. Yeah, I said, I was told the galley sailors weren't leaked. I wondered if they were well treated, and yes, thinking of the two of the upper body of them, plus showing off to, to new girlfriend who I, I'm watching over shoulder. <laughs> well, hello, you're a good you this age. And yes, they were an elite. And again, this is another reason why calling them being slaves is probably not a good idea, because you've heard about the stories about longbowmen in medieval periods, who were ma massively over their shoulders. I mean, massively. They sort of looked like, up here. They, they, they would make most modern wrestlers and those sort of big heavyweight boxers, etc. go, and then good little legs. Um, so kind of like the modern US Marines. Go. But, Sort of, it's the same for the Ormond, because the, what they're doing is such heavy-duty work, and you need to have them fit, they need to be healthy. Oh my god, they need to be fit and healthy. Again, there's another reason why you don't want them slaves, because you need them to be able to walk around shit when they're, when they're not out on the oar. You need them to be fit and healthy, you need them to be able to move and feed and move. You cannot have them tied down in all place, because if they, are, if they collapse on you, because they're unfit, unwell, then your ship's gone. And especially when we're talking about ram battles, which we'll be getting into a second, the whole, the survivability of the ship and its whole ability as an offensive power is entirely tied to its maneuverability, which is entirely tied to those banks of oars, which have to be handled correctly and with enough strength. Is that really a job you want entrusted to someone who will also who will actually is basically has no whose life is worthless in their eyes and yours? What's their motivation? It can only get worse. We could get killed by the enemy, or they could free us if we kill you. Hmm. Sergeant, why do history maps bother drawing a border in the in, in line of the desert in the Sahara in the desert for Carthage? Well, because uh, if I go back again to this map, you will notice that below this map is a place called Numidians. And Numidians are, well, a tribal class destroyer was, uh, was um, sort of named for them. And they were a fairly capable and quite scary group, especially cavalry wise. Very good. And uh, Nuran Cash, the Minions should have been given a tribal. The, the, the New Minions were given a tribal. HMS Nubian. We call them today the modern spelling we use from is Numidian. Spelling in that time uh, when Nubian was first named was Nubian. At least that's my re my reading of it. If someone knows better, I'm happy to be corrected, but my reading of it was that.
Diggerish is fine. Rome Total War it is then you talk. It's good. I do like Rome Total War. I, I have to say I prefer the original version. So. This is the war has started, and it's going on for a long time. Remember, we're talking about a battle which took place in 241 BC. In the final year of the war. The war started in 264 BC. In simple terms, it lasted for 23 years. Imagine that. A war going on for 23 years. There is... One list, uh, one, uh, one example given, which is that, well, I've got my figure. In the First Punic War, the Romans lost somewhere in the region. Of between, I think, da, 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 da. the Romans lost some region of seven percent of their male population killed in the war. And by the way, that seven percent is going to be from their freemen. And that doesn't include the people who were injured and dead. And that's an estimate, which one, his, uh, that's the low end of the estimates put together by a historian who is fairly decent. But there are estimates which go higher, including one which puts it at a lot more than 7%. It is certainly something which they lose a lot of people in. A lot of people. And for those who were wondering with that battle which was mentioned earlier, which will also be talked about, um, the Battle of Cape Hermione is the battle where the Carthaginians are defeated and then the Roman fleet when it's returning to Italy, um, is devastated by a storm and loses 100,000 men in a storm. It's huge numbers of losses. And the thing is, we have very accurate records for those losses because we have crew rosters and we have crew lists in terms of numbers and how they were outfitted. So we know exactly how many people were lost. It's one of those interesting things that you have more in you have more of a history associated with land warfare for the Roman Navy for the Romans than you do naval warfare, and yet in many ways we have more knowledge of how many people they lost fighting their sea battles than our land battles. Ah, uh, yes, because being neutral party and asking two big empires for aid always ends, uh, ends well for you and them. Yeah. Sicily was pretty important to the Carthaginians. It was a critical point for them in terms of their control and their setting up their position for the control of the Western, Med uh, of the Western Mediterranean. Aaron, Osman, look at Olympic Rose. I have met a few and they are just Different scales norm people. Yeah. Damn him. Galley slave was really an invention of the early modern period, was it? it? Let's put it this way. You're only going to want to have slaves as your oarsmen if you're a merchant ship and if you're not go if you're in an area which is already heavily controlled by the military. So if anything happens to you, those oarsmen aren't going to get anywhere. They're going to get caught by the military as pirates. And even then, you probably prefer not to it because you're only going to end up dead.
Thomas, what's North Africa a desert time? It's not as much of a desert as you'd think. There are certainly oases and there are areas, again, if you go to Rome Total War, it does a fairly good job of illustrating what it's like. That's the box. Aren't you being people from, Sudan, uh, from Sudan? Mm. Let me just check. Yeah, you're right. No, you're right. That was wrong. No, I did. I, I think I thought there was a connection between the UBI. Oh. What's the connection with the email? That was... Mm. There is a connection between HS and UBIN and UBIN and But no, that one's wrong. I must remember that one wrong. Oh well. Sorry. <laughs> there is something. I know I wrote it in the book. But no, this day is not about that. Today is about this thing, so we'll get on. Oh well. Right, let's get back to questions. And the sources. Thirty eight five. Uh, is, the, is the real reason for tra and the tradition from heavy blows to guns, guns bows talk about the same amount of time to learn to aim, but guns don't take twenty years to uh, for the muscles. Yep. Don't go, remember wars were far less totally intense than allies. I, I, I don't take this the wrong way, but when you have hundreds of thousands of people being involved in battles on both sides, I don't think we can really claim it's less intense. Uh, we can we can certainly make arguments in cases that they are more seasonal, that they are impacted more about the weather and the ability to produce grain and food supplies. We can certainly make those cases uh, that it's less total. Uh, but when you have, as I said, when you have battles which involve 290,000 personnel, that's kind of massive. I mean, uh, I, I can see your point, but I'm also going 290,000 in the Battle of Economus. This one is pretty large. The Battle of Agates involves somewhere in the region of 200 Quinca Marines and on both sides. And as a rule, a uh, Quinca Marine has a crew. Well, a fully decked out Quinca Marine will have a crew of between 70 and 120. Marines would have ninety. A standard would have ninety oars on each side, and each of those oars would have five. Well, no, they're across the those banked in three sets of oars, and you know some of those oars uh, that that sort of two two one for the oarsman. So. One on the lower deck, two, and then two, on the three sets of banks of oars. So uh, that's what, 20 for those 10, 20 for those 10, 10 for those, I don't know, 90 oars. Also, it's 30. So it's 60, 60, and 30, which is 100 and... 50 oarsmen on each side, so that's roughly 300. Uh, a, cr a deck crew of roughly 20 to 30, uh, let's say 120, so you're probably dealing with 400 to 450 per crew, per ship. So you have 200 times 450, 
Well, that's about 90,000 in each fleet. The modern Royal Navy would love to have 90,000 personnel. And we don't have any advantage, uh, uh, examples of a Quinker Marine currently in existence, and now we're talking about the ships, it makes sense. But this is a lovely example of a Byrene. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's quite simple, but it's it's got space for oars, at, uh, you know, two sets of oarsmen, uh, the, the, two, a, a pair of oarsmen on each uh, on each oar. Now, it can be a Byrene can also mean two uh, two banks of oars and a single row on each side. This is like. That's what I is going to be a lot about this. And a lot of the sum, I'm going to say there is a debate because there is. There is discussions. Uh, the Quinker Marine. This is a stone building which is apparently built in the fashion of a Quinker Marine to, to give you an example and give you some idea of the shaping and what you're dealing with. But honestly, <sighs> this is where I reach for this. This is some of the earlier ideas of how they banked people together. At the top, that looks like trireme, but it's also kind of the model of what we think about for these, because when you talk about a quadrine, you're talking about four personnel. So you could probably do that with two people on each oar, sets of oars, or could do that with two people on one oar, uh, on the probably the top one, and then one and then one on the lower oar, on the oars going down, sort of in, in back oars. Because it all comes from the trireme. And it's all about getting motive power. Quinkramine, two, two, one. And we have a small problem when we use those because Polybus, who is that really good source, he also tends to use Quinkramine as shorthand for battleship or warship, kind of like modern newspapers do. So, yes, he's very accurate, but. And yes, we have it listed as the Romans were building Quinker Marines, which were pretty heavy, but they could have also been building something ever bigger, a Hexamarine or a Septamarine or an Octares or an Ancres or a Decres, although those are very, very rare. And in fact, most of their larger ones are mainly known about in terms of Pliny the Elder's descriptions of Philip, Maced uh, Philip of Macedon's. Um, Fleet because he was sort of obsessive. In fact, Philip V of Macedonia is uh, massively obsessed with building the biggest, most powerful ships he can possibly build. And in fact, there is another guy who is um, another Macedonian king who comes after uh, Philip, who's called Demetrius, and his son Antogus, who well, build 20s and 30s and all sorts of things. And then comes in the Egyptians, who basically are kind of like the world's biggest one-uppers at this point, and um, builds a 40, which is technically called a Tessacantorines, uh, which required 4,000 rowers, had the ability to accommodate nearly 3,000 marines and 400 other crew. Um, so we're talking probably in the exchange of 8,000 people aboard that ship. Just in for case you think the uh, the uh, new the US aircraft carriers and their large crews are something um, new. Most people, though, don't want that many people on one ship, especially not a ship which is supposed to be about ramming. But there again, I'm not sure I'd want to ram it. Uh, there are arguments that these ships were, some of them were catamarans or those things, sort of bigger ones, but we'll see, it, we're, no one's quite sure. There's a lot of discussion about it.
So anyway, I can see my point, the walls are more drawn out, it seems. Yes, the walls took longer, mainly because everything took longer to get there and you had to build it all. I was also, where are the fluffy galleys? I don't have fluffy galleys, unfortunately. I would like a fluffy galley. Fluffy galleys are cool. Um, Vision, were sea battles more expensive, so they had to do more accounting, so more records of Ireland was also committed and lost? Yes, definitely more expensive. Okay, stupid question. That's only just occurred to me, which is strange that I read a lot on subject, but why are they called Punic Wars? That's quite an interesting question. <laughs> but, uh, now, they're called the Punic Wars. Oh. I think it's literally because of that, but let me just check now, because now you've asked it, the answer is... Um... Yeah. Punic is basically, uh, it refers to the language and, uh, language and operator and actually Carthage itself. So basically Punic Wars literally mean the Carthage Wars as far as the Romans were concerned. Which come from the Greek version or well, it comes from the Greek Phoenus, which meant Phoenician. So you know it's a fun time of history. Right then. That's right. What were the design flaws in these ships? Oh, so many. We'll be getting into that at some point. <laughs> Uh, but no, it's they all start out as the triremes, because basically the whole idea is you're needing motive power, which isn't dependent upon wind, because they don't have the sail system, and also the Mediterranean doesn't have the wind that they can really build upon it with their existing sail structures. Roman and Agirica, I guess, historians have a bad habit of referring to people's as they were known to their contemporaries, or to who their leader was. I had a gossip sack Rome and those that, uh, those, uh, da, 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 uh, fleeing to Rome and won the battle of have no real ties in the sources, or referring to all numbered countries north as Huns, hundred years before the Huns appear. Oh yeah, it's fun. So anyway, quick ring, probably three people on one and two people on the other. No, uh, that one actually is one we do actually know. The Quinker Marine we do actually know quite well was a fr was either a free or a five orb system, depending on the description. As I said, this is one of the earlier descriptions, but we do re uh, we do think it was a free orb system because that seems to be what people have uh, they go with, and they're very clear in their designs and depictions and their freezes, etc. It's a free orb system, so uh, two two one is the is the probable option. Oh, good. You know, I said, what was the crew accommodation like on galleys? Did the rowers live aboard in the, aboard like in Age of Sail? Yeah, everyone lived on the ship. That's the thing. They they you lived on the ship. Yes, we often talk about them doing being basically coastal hopping vessels, but they were more than that. They would go across the Mediterranean, etc. They would be at sea for days at a time, and they did have to live aboard them. Crew accommodation was basic. But it was fine for the time. Ah, right, fell 1981. Good evening, Dr. Clark. Where did the wood and tar and ropes for the ships come from? It depends on the Navy. Uh, to be honest, the Romans had various sources of tar in Italy, which they mostly took out of bogs. And it's mostly a sort of the natural sort of stuff which comes out of the bogs which is being used. 
the wood for their ships. They got that. Is that from southern or northern Italy? I'm not sure. I know they had a lot of trouble getting the rope. The rope was the big problem for the Romans. And I think they got that using getting stuff from Egypt. A lot of uh, so they reported some materials for rope from Egypt. Don't change. Forty rows of oars are like uh, are of a ream, like how you do the same. Uh, drawings or images of what it looks like. There are a few drawings or images, and I'm going to be getting for those in a second. So. Basically, I have some more. I have lots of drawings, and images, ships because that's basically my thing. So this is what. What is all this about? What is all this all power about? Well, it's about the super weapon of the time. And actually, these I think are pictures from rams the uh, 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 recovered from the site in Agapes. This is a ram which is currently uh, which is has been found off the coast of Israel and is in is an Israeli museum. But it sort of shows you the style. And the whole purpose of a ram is to whack into your enemy. Okay, there are two points. You can be, you have to be quite careful. If you do not ram at the right angle, you can end up end up with your ship getting stuck in the enemy ship as it goes down, and that will take you down as well. There's also options with the ramming. You can end up hitting another, the Arab of the other ship, and this is what we think has happened to this ram. If you look in the bottom at the bottom left, you can see it's lost chunks, and you think that's because there's actually been a ram on ram contact. They are masses, massive wedges of bronze. They are incredibly expensive. They are. Very, very difficult to make, and they require a quality of construction far beyond what is normally required for bronze work at the time. These are the super weapon of their period. Being able to build rams is important. It's the big limit. It's the big cost on a ship. It's the big limit on your ability to produce warships. How many rams can you make? And it's actually the big advantage the Romans have, because actually they have slightly more advanced metallurgy than the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians go into this, into this war with a far larger fleet going, we can win, we can win. The Roman advantage comes from their ability to keep building more rams. So they can keep churning out fleets. So even when the Carthaginians win, and this uh, a thing which we often say is sort of Greeks versus Romans, etc., and also the Greek, the Greco Phoenician, uh, Phoenician history was of you had a big battle, and that basically decided who took lead in negotiations or the peace afterwards. Well, the Romans don't play that way. The Romans lose a battle and go, well, we need to come back again, don't we? With more, more, yes, more, 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 more. Okay. The Romans are those sort of. How do I put this? Give you an example. Uh, you get knocked down, they get back up again. They get knocked down, they get back up again. They get knocked down, they get back up again. That's their advantage. And the Carthaginians had been doing that as well for a long time, but the Carthaginians have a problem. Their empire is built upon maritime trade. The problem for them is that it is an east-west trade. And that is what they've been doing. North, south, east, west. And the problem for them really is that the Romans are moving north, and are moving east, and moving west, and moving south. And the Romans economy is not so much based upon trade as it is based on export but also warfare. Consuls want to be a general after they finish the thing. They want to be a general. The reason they want to be a general is because that allows them to earn a lot of money in the Roman system. The Carthaginian political system we're getting into later uh, is Slightly less enamoured with generals, a generalship.
Don't shake. Good enough for everybody else. Good enough for you to build something. Uh, Ptolemy the Fall built it. A fourth built it. I think he was. Was he Cleopatra's father? I'm trying to remember which one. Well, the, the, the Ptolemies are interesting. Um, da -da 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 -da. Yes, Ptolemy the Fall. No, I, I think he was. Uh, I think the famous Cleopatra, in terms of it, uh, was. Oh, good lord. Many, many Cleopatras later. There are lots of Cleopatras. There are so many Ptolemies. It's just... Get new names, people. Please. Make life a little easier for historians. We're going to be getting into that in a second, though, because there's going to be a rant about a Carthaginian name shortly. <laughs> oh... Good 85. Old warships are also more maneuverable, and in a system of combat based on ramming, boarding, close range missile combat, and maneuverability is key. Very. Uh, the, the ram shape is also n not about punching a clean hull, it's about smashing up the hulls without getting stuck. Yeah. And that is one of the reasons why it's shaped as it is. And actually, there is also another point that if it does get stuck, this is supposed to make it easier to withdraw in its shaping. It's supposed to punch up. They still do get stuck. Please don't take us the wrong way, but they still get stuck. As much as they try and advise them not to, they still do get stuck. But they do their best to make sure they don't get stuck, and they do punch a hole. And it's supposed to punch a hole which splinters the wood. Uh, Cleopatra the seventh was the famous one. Probably the seventh one. You're pro I think you're probably right, but honestly, they, after a while, they, they, they start to confuse me. All right. So, let's consider Carthage. Now, I have to admit, this is a creative assembly picture which I got off Google. So, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to use it, but I have mentioned that it's their copyright and they are the ones who sourced it, so please note I'm not claiming this one. And this one is an aerial photography of the remains of Carthage. As you can see, Carthage is completely built around its port. We have the Mercantile Harbour which is in the centre and etc. But in the bottom is the military harbour, the bottom right. And this is what this is supposed to be, the military harbour. And as you can see in the map, and this sort of drawing is as vision as it was, it was one long thing. And it's hugely important. That was a complete circle. It's a hugely important space. It's all built up. It's kind of like Venice. If you go to Venice, there's the Venetian arsenal, where they had all the storage for their galleys, and they were all stored up and steady, and you know they were all looked after there. This is a huge facility. There are advantages and there are disadvantages to this, but it is a major commitment to create it. And you have to also consider the fact that this is part of the Phoenician legacy. This is, in many ways, a Basilocratic nation as well.
Rome, in contrast, is our wealth. This is uh, this is an imagining of Rome, I'd say of a later period, but it's a nice it's a nice illustration of what Rome is, and what Rome go, Ro goes on to be. Fact is, Carthage is on the coast. Carthage is, by its nature, a port city. Rome isn't. Rome is an inland city. Rome is an army power. They are a military power. And they are built as such. Also, Carthage has had an advantage. Yes, it's had to fight. But it's had a far more relatively peaceful time of seizing control of things than the Romans have. The Romans have basically had to fight from their inception for their survival. So they are very much a military power and very, very stubborn. That's what they're there for. That's what the Romans are known for and that's what the Romans really are. They are stubborn. They are focused around it and they've never chosen to be anything else. The Carthaginians are, by more nature, traders. They have military power, and they have naval power, but they are kind of like Venice, in that their position in North Africa was far enough from everyone and close enough to good sources of trade, and specifically good sources of wheat production, that they were independent and could trade with people. Venice had built itself up as a mercantile trading power, I would say Carthage is an earlier example of that. Rome, if we're looking for a sort of medieval similarity, we're looking more probably at Spain than we are at Venice. Both superpowers in their own time and major powers, but the fact is, in reality, if the Habsburgs had really of Spain had really put their effort into it, they could have taken out Venice. Vision looks like a railroad roundhouse from Major Scene. It's true. That is basically what's gone into there. The idea is you have the maximum amount of space and the maximum efficiency, efficient usage of space. Um, Heracles 444. Yeah, the Romans had their butts kicked on sea and fought. We'll copy the Greeks to do it better. To be fair, they what they did was they copied the Carthaginians. Carthage is in North Africa. If we go back again to this map at the beginning, you can see Carthage. Carthage is a very big city for itself. Right on the uh, right in North Africa, uh, Rome, far more on land, and Syracuse is another major city state. Okay, you, you, we cannot discount Syracuse completely in all this scenario. They are a major place. So, the Roman fleet, and here you go, as a nice example of the structures being used and of the people being involved. Now, as you can see, if you look at this little sort of drawing, you'll see two, two, one in the configuration. And that's, broadly speaking, what we think the Quinca Marines were like. Two people on the oars at the to uh, on the top two oars, tiers of oars, at each of the top two oars, and one person on the bottom. And ideally, in a fight, you wanted to be on the middle pair, because, well, you were less exposed. As you can see, there's also a beautiful in illustration of a Corvus there. Now, interestingly enough, in this battle, and the preceding naval battle, the Corvus don't really get used. There's also an illustration on there of a siege ship, where you tie two warships together and you mount a siege tower on it, and you use, them, you use that to get close to the naval or sea walls. Dan Freeman, Ptolemic Dynasty. If it was good enough for my father, uncle, and aunt mother, then it's good enough for me and my sister wife.
Yeah, they're weird. Let's let's just let's just leave it as the Ptolemies as weird. Okay. Mm. Ollie. Yeah, merchant naval powers and they don't suppress the size. Yeah, it's a it's a strange thing to suggest merchant naval powers. But the Roman fleet is majoritively, it seems, with these ships. And I have a reason for actually believing Ptolemy on this point. And my reason is this. Honestly, the Carthaginians, and we'll get into why, are probably not fielding that many massive or bigger ships. They are not. Um, they are building a certain number of ships, but they're probably equivalent to Quinca Marines. There's also the fact that once you build something even bigger and more complicated than this, it takes more time to get people proficient in manning it. This is complicated ship to row. It's a complicated ship to use. And the Romans have suffered sufficient losses before this battle that they are basically building a fleet from scratch. Now, the Roman system of service and leadership etc means that they do always have a bank of people with experience in reserve it's one of the advantages of the roman whole the whole roman structure they always have a bank of their, their whole system is built around people alternating in military and a civil career especially on your path to becoming consul etc and that means that there are always people who will have recent military experience who are not fighting on the front lines who can, if necessary, transfer into those roles. And it is good at building up a deck of experience. But, saying that, you probably don't want to go for anything bigger. It's got three banks of ores, and that's again standard. It's. <laughs> One of the things, once we go, look, look at this, 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 uh, this idea, this one. So don't go, yes, well, A, you're massively tall, and B, five banks of oars. Imagine how difficult that's going to be to row, what the likelihood of complication and conflict is going to be. It's far easier to put more people on the oars and have bigger, tougher, and heavier oars so you can pull more water. Uh, Run cash, is the boarding bridge called a corpus? Yes. Yes, as in the Corvus Corax in 40k, yes, it's named for it. So the Quinca Marine is like a 74-gun third rate, or a Sherman. It's like a 74-gun third rate. It's Sherman, no. Um, it's something slightly... It, 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 let, let's put it this way. I love the Sherman, but that's more like a fourth rate that's produced. And they are gorgeous ships. They are really quite well built ships. But again, we go into the, the history of them built, being built. Now, a Santa Quinca Marine is probably, and it's going to sound strange, roughly 45 meters long would displace 100 tons, be about 5 metres wide at wharf level, and have its deck standing roughly 3 metres above the sea. And pretty much the arguments and accounts by Livy, Diodorus and Polybus all come down to the idea that the Romans had seized a shipwrecked Carthaginian Quinca Marine and use its blueprint for their own ships. However, the Roman ships are heavier than their Carthaginian vessels. Carthaginian vessels are considered better built. But I'm not sure I think about I agree with that because, yes, the Roman ships being heavier is going to make them more difficult to maneuver and we're going to mean you're going to require even more from your oarsmen. They're going to be, you have to be even more <laughs> to get the equivalent speed of them. And they probably won't reach the same top speed as their Carthaginian counterparts. 
But it's also, if they're probably built heavier, that means they're probably going to be more solid. And uh, when they hit and ram a ship, they might well stay together longer. Because the ramming will cause damage to the ship which does the ramming, as well as the ship which is rammed. Remember, the shock energy will travel all along that hull. Now, there are various odds of how fast they could go, but I'm fairly, fairly certain that the work done by John Coates, who unfortunately died in 2010 and was pretty much a naval architect, who again... My dad worked with on the county class destroyers um, many, many years ago. He worked out and he reckoned a, a, a um, galley could go seven knots for extended periods. You know, and I reckon that's probably about right. In after the battle of, I think it's uh, Drapana, where the Romans lost most of their fleet, and at this point the Romans decided they needed to build a new fleet. Uh, it was Drapana and the Pinatas, uh, the Carthaginians won a huge battle. Of, I was going to, and the Romans, as said went to their uh, Ralphia citizens for loans. The Carthaginians tried to go to Ptolemaic in, uh, Egypt and ask for a loan, and they got turned down. The Senate went to their, uh, to their wealthier citizens. And it's 200 Quinca Marines. Built, equipped, crewed, all the things that need to be done, ready, outfitted, Without a single government at any government expense, but this also means that those particular gentle, uh, people who have donated the, these ships are ensuring that there are the best available commanders put on them. So this is kind of an interesting fleet because it's a fleet which is a new fleet, so it's having to be raised up, but it's also got every bit of experience put into it. It's going to contrast with the poor Carthaginian. The corpus was abandoned in the construction of these ships. So, in the ships which are actually going to own this fleet, they don't have the bridge. They don't have the corpus because it's not no longer needed. The commanders, Gaius Lutalius Catalus and Quintus Vatari Avalis Felto, were obsessed, uh, um, especially obsessed, with the idea of making sure that their crews received good treatment, including adequate diet, and created a fleet so that it would be at its peak of their ability. Again, you're drilling the crews in maneuvers and exercises as often as you can. You're feeding them. There are all sorts of things going on here which, yes, you might a sensible person would probably treat their slaves this way. But again, the reality is, I'm fairly uh, what I think, and as I've gone on for this, but I'm going into this again. My suspicion is that the oarsmen were given to the ships, and the deal was you do your service, you're a freed man. So technically, you're a free man already on the ship. We can treat you as such. You're not going to mutiny because you want to be a freed person in Rome. And especially, as many slaves were not just tend, didn't just tend to be soldiers captured from other places where they Romans have fought. They also could well be people who've been sold in slavery to pay off their debts, 
people have been born in slavery. So becoming a free man in Rome was actually quite something they want to do. So your dad did work on every ship. I was like, no, but my dad... Basically, if the Royal Navy built a warship from about 1950 to... Or built or designed a warship between 1950 and... Uh, ooh, probably 2015. Actually, to an extent later than that, my dad would have been involved in some way or form. Because he was that kind of naval architect. He just loved them going around them. Oh gosh, didn't the Romans have a load of partially built prefab great parts to rapidly expand their fleet near Ostia? Not really, but they did have a production facility at Ostia which was allowed them to build a churn out rams. And they could do this. But again, it uh, there's later stuff which is they do build at Ostia and the facilities they do have at Ostia which gets grown up as a result of the Punic Wars, especially during the Second Punic War. That tends to affect and colour our opinion of how they should be behaving in the First Punic War. Sorry if that came as a sound, I was just more impressed by how much your dad got a go around. They're just one of the things, if I'm again the story of my dad, um he was one of the first proponents of computer aided design in ship uh, construction and he did he worked out pretty much all the stuff to do with it. Uh he did all sorts of random things like that. So he tended to get called into various things. He was very good at what he did. Wasn't always a great dad, as I've said in the Torah past, but Always an exceptional naval architect, it seems. <sighs> the Carthaginian fleet. Well, here is the thing. That beautiful building back there, which some people call the Admiralty, and I'm using a shorthand for this, um, gives us an insight into the possible fleet structure. Now, I say it's into the possible insight. Because most permitted only vessels are 4.8 meters wide, so that's the picture of a Traer pictured. Uh, so roughly the same size as a Quinca Marine. Because if we go back and we sort of talk about Quinca Marine, they're roughly 5 meters in, uh, in width. And however, in the islet of the Admiralty, there were two holds, two for holds of 7 meters wide. So potentially, those were large flagships. However, here is the thing. I would agree that I think the majority of the Carthaginian fleet was, the 74s of their period, were Traeers, which were their version of a Quinca Marine. They do seem to have had, again, three banks of oars and between five and six rowers. That's what I'm sort of reading from the accounts. But again, I'm saying this based on very little information about the Carthaginian side. We have very little information, only Roman accounts, broadly speaking, of the Carthaginians survive. So we're doing this from one side, largely, and Polybius is probably the best example of that. Uh, so far being found to be accurate, but... But the reality is, as the war went on, you're probably going to need more of those bigger ships. And if you've already built a couple, you can build more. And yes, storing them out of the out of water is very normal, especially out of season, out of campaigning season, when the storms get too big and you don't want the ships damaged. You want to store them out of water. You want to dry them, season the wood, check the wood. All those yes. But I can build temporary structures. I don't need to build a massive Admiralty again or rebuild it all to accommodate a few more of those larger ships. And I would probably want a couple, though, a few more of those large ships. 
especially as some of the battles I've lost and having some of those larger ships available will be useful. Is this also the time they started putting Scorpion and Ballista on ships? Yes, they started putting artillery on their ships. I'm not sure if it's Scorpion and Ballista exactly, but it's certainly things of that idea. So, there are potentially larger ships, and the Carthaginian fleet is homogenous to an extent. So, I think they are concentrated on producing numbers of ships. And when you start considering some of these battles involved, well, okay, the fleet the Romans sent to this battle, the fleet they've deployed to go to Sicily is based around, as I said, 200 Quinca Marines and roughly 700 transports. The transports were carrying legionnaires and supplies. The Carthaginian fleet that is coming out, that they will end up engaging, has 250 warships and 150 to 350 transports. We are talking massive fleets. 200 quinqua means, as I was talking earlier, is near enough makes no difference, 90,000 personnel. And that's not including the legionnaires and the personnel put on those transports. So you are talking a huge force is being sent. We are not talking a small movement. And that is another reason probably for the time it takes and the reason why these wars go on so long. Because, again, think of it. How long did it take the British to build up for D-Day? British and Americans to build up for D-Day. That hundreds of thousands of troops. Ships, everything to deploy. This is what the equivalent manpower you're talking about. Yes, that takes years to build those ships. Years to crew them. Years to train the personnel. Well, imagine doing that in the pre-industrial age. It's going to take a lot longer to put it together. Now, I've already talked about the Romans having a slight advantage. And the Romans really did have a slight advantage when it came to their leadership structure. It seems, from our apparent knowledge of the Carthaginian leadership structure, which I am openly going to say, the books I've read, mostly focus on the Roman ones. In the book Send a Gunboat, there are images of the Victoria Marine Railway and a large iron shed that stores small gunboats and torpedoes for the iron. Hmm. But anyway, what woods would they be using, and would this be different for, for the Romans and the Carthaginians? Would this affect their performance? Uh, yes, but I'm trying to remember the actual sort of differences. The Romans, I understood it, I think. The Roman wood source, as I will understand it, comes from the forests which are supposed to be in northern Italy. But I could be wrong. Let me check my notes again. The trouble is, I haven't taught this in a while. Yeah, most of the wood 
seems to come from their areas in northern Italy. And the Carthaginians were just not sure about it, but the, presumably they sourced the wood from local to them. But this, again, is the problem with the data uh, that we have. We have, when a sh one of these ships gets sunk, we find the ram. The wood has mostly gone away. It's 2,000 years ago, the wood has mostly disappeared and rotted away, so we're not 100% sure on the differences. But the most of the Roman wood we seem to uh, we believe comes from uh, came from northern Italy. I mean, I know they really loved wood from southern France once they had control of southern France, <laughs> but northern Italy at this point. Anyway, so I'm going to expand this out. This for a second. To be a consul, you had to be 42 years old. You couldn't become a chief justice, a praetor, until you were 39 years old. You couldn't become uh, an ideal until you were 36 years old. Tribunes had to be 27 years old. Kestas had to be 30 years old. And legion officers had to be at least 20 years old. If you are a patrician, well, you could your age could be dropped down two years earlier. So if you're born in the highest class, however, there are various rules for what you do. There, the censor is important. Taking the censors, supervision of public morality. In many ways, they are a former consul who is a really, really powerful and scary person in Roman life. Because they will have a lot of political power over the current consul. As they are, as I said, taking the census and supervision of public morality, i.e. They are one of the checks on the powers of the consuls. And in fact, there are two consuls, one in time, is out of this. Proconsuls are former consuls as well. But after they've got their, uh, served their time as consul, they are, uh, their commission is continued. So they're given a governorship of a region, etc., and the legions in that region to go and fight a war. Uh, Usually the consuls both could be off leading consular armies, but it's rare Rome let both go away at the same time. If both consuls are out of Rome, then there's a big problem. Dictator is something which exists one at a time. They, have, they are nominated for a single task, and once that's completed, their time in post is over. Dictators have unquestionably the most power because they are the... How to put it? They can't really be critiqued by anyone. Censors, consuls, they are in charge of them all. It's very rare Rome appoints such a single person authority. Now, you ha will notice that there is Propraetor, which is another governorship or military command post you can use, uh, be can use for. So either if you've been a, a Praetor, and serve your time, you can go off and become a proprietor and be appointed to go and serve that. In fact, people can go right way through this rule and have the various commands and po uh, posts or it, for it. So pro means you've served something, but you're still able to exercise the powers of that office in the position you have been placed. In con contrast, the Carthaginians we know less about, but we do know that they have something from the consuls, and they have the suffetes. We do know they are both oligarch democracies, in that they have a rich, powerful body 
who tend to provide most of the politicians and most of the groups, but they do have a limited franchise. Again, as usual, dominated by the rich. Both had senates, which would involve all the power, uh, as many of the powerful people as they could, because that kept everyone on side. The Carthaginians preferred commissions and committees to the Romans elected individuals, and also, interesting enough, generals under Carthage system tended to serve the length of the war to provide continuity, whereas in Rome, they served as long as they were considered up to the task. Also, only one of the suffits could be away at a time being general. So usually they weren't actually using magistrates as it, they were appointing people to be generals. And there's, a, uh, there's an interesting thing, the lictors, etc., whether they're appointed as bodyguards or whether they're carrying all these poles is... They're just their symbol of is their symbol of office and their status because basically a lictor tells you how many you know it's the rods are used for for laying out and working out roads and structures and so if you have twenty four lictors you can lay out far more of a road network because of the bundle of um, well fascists they carry. Vision sensor and sensors have the same Latin root. Hmm. I mean, there has been a lot of deforestation period since all this happened. If you modern Israel was part, of, was partly deforestated to build the siege works in Masada. Yeah, uh, that's After a period, the land needed centuries to regenerate and give good harvest again in the Middle Ages. So the Roman commanders. Well, you have two of them. You have a very interesting gentleman who is consul in two forty two BC. So. Technically, he's in charge of a consular army. And that is Gaius Latu Lut Lutatius Catullus. Um, he was born a member of the Plebeians. Interesting enough, Catullus, his uh, cognomen means puppy. He began his service in the cavalry and basically worked his way up what is called the Cursus Honorum, that route of leadership which I told you. So he starts off as a plebeian and he manages to work his way up. He therefore has fought his way up, quite literally. He will have had to do various positions. We know he served as a military tribune and caster. So he, and we know you, it's basically impossible, especially for someone who's born a plebeian, to skip a step. So he's gone up, started off in the cavalry, sort of this area, and has managed to move up through service. He has quite literally fought his way to the top. We know more about his time as consul. His colleague was Attulus Postumus Almanus, and he also held the position of, well, Postumus held the position of sort of High Priest of, of Mars. So, so Postumus couldn't actually leave the city. This is one of the reasons why. Quintus Valius Falto is appointed as Lutatius' uh, second in command. The whole point being, usually when you send out a large fleet under both combined or a large force under both consuls, they share command, or one of them sort of acts as the second in command, the other one as the first in command. But you, as a rule, sort of they they alternate days in command where they are in charge of the force. If there's a battle that day, they're in charge of the other one. Something's worked out, or they divide the fleet up, which is also what happened. 
But what I haven't said is because Postumus is this head of the head of the uh, Mars, uh, he's the high priest of Mars. Same time, they go. To, they promote uh, a point of Praetor. Quintus Valerius Falto, Praetor Perigenus, as his second in command. So, they've got a Praetor and a Consul. And this gives you an idea of where they are in their careers. The Praetor is the trainee Consul. And interesting enough, he actually becomes a Consul in 239 BC. So, two years later, three years later, he is a Consul. This is what's happening. This is the Roman system at work. At this point, he's going into battle as second in command. Very experienced commander. Very experienced second in command. Technically in command, but actually ill injured by at the time of battle, so not in charge. Second in command is still very experienced. Things have been set up by the first in command, and then carry out. And I don't have pictures of either of them surviving, but uh, we do have a picture of the, uh, the Temple of Jutana. Uh, Jutana which is pictured here, which is built by Gaius Lutatius uh, Catalus. Technically, by the time of the battle, they were pro-consul and pro praetors uh, pro because they'd been continued in post. Because they were still they were doing well enough, they did went off and did this as consul and praetor. The campaigning was carrying on, so they actually go and be, are put in uh, and carry on as pro praetor uh, as pro consul and pro praetor. I they the Senate has decided they're doing a good enough job. They're keeping them in post. So I should have him pro Praetor Praragonus and pro Consul by this point, but. By 241. It's good times. It's good times when you're dealing with a Roman command structure. It does make sense. The irony that someone named Puppy built a temple somewhere that's now partly famous for being a cat sanctuary. It's life. Carl Virginia fleet leader, Hanno, son of Hannibal Gisco, who's the land forces commander. We. This is the point I'm making here is. I can tell you all sorts of facts about these their careers. I can go to Quinto Valier Stalto, and he actually has a Wikipedia page. But he also has a page on some on the dictionary of Greek and Roman uh, biography and mythology, uh, put together by William Smith in 1870, which you can find. If you go, uh, if you go to the Wikipedia page, you can find a link which actually works. So actually, the page is on, so you can find them out that way. Giving me a hint how to go and get it. It's a really cool thing to read, and I actually have now got a copy of that book on its way to me. Reprint. I'll see what it's like. Good. I'll share it with you. All. Anyway. Gaius Lutatius Catullus is injured during the siege of Doprana, and so Falto takes over the command of the forces. Now, it actually, I will get into this before we actually get to the end. This actually leads to an issue because he does so well that he wanted to share the triumph to which Catullus was entitled at the end because of the great victory. Claim was originally rejected on grounds that he was an inferior officer. Interestingly enough, though, then Alus Alitaius Calatinus 
who arbitrates and rules against him again. But the people, i.e. the plebeians, did a huge protest and insisted that Falto deserved the honour. Now, you have to remember, of course, again, with the Republican armies, the Republic Age armies, they're not like the legionnaires. They are drawn from the citizenry. And there's also the fair, so there is that respect there, but also I have a distinct impression that Catalyst, whilst not wanting to share his own triumph with Valerius Falto, felt that Falto should have a triumph. Because my reading of some of the things around it seems very much that Catalyst support those protests. He doesn't want to share a triumph, because that's annoying. I don't want to share my moment with the sun. But he doesn't see anything wrong with his second-in-command having his own triumph, because that's going to help with his second-in-command going on to become consul in 239 BC, and that's quite useful, because then you've had your, your friends in charge again. But what do we know about Hanno? Well, he's son of Hannibal Gisco who we think was the guy in charge of the city which was under siege at the point when the, you know, we go back to this map, we think he was involved in the city, he was one of the people on the siege, we think he actually was one of the people who'd been under siege in Agritinum when it was when it fell. We're not quite sure. But he seems to have vengeance in mind. It also seems to be quite a badly prepared fleet. We will talk about the Carthaginian fleet again quickly, because I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier in enough detail. But the Carthaginian fleet is definitely not well put together. Carthage has been fighting a lot in North Africa at this point. They have got a lot of troops, a lot of operations going on around the world, in sort of the Mediterranean world, and the Carthaginians take months to try and get a fleet together. They put nine months, is usually what is considered. They are pressed for times, uh, for uh, time. They are pressed for supplies, and they do not have time to train their personnel, and they do not get the sufficient personnel together. And in fact, their great idea is that they would repeat what they'd already done a couple of times before. They would get the fleet to the Agid he is uh, again eight islands and would use the wind to surge in to probably the Rafana, um, link up with the uh, commander of the army in that area and his troops, and get them aboard. And once they're aboard, they can then go off and fight and do what they need to do. And they would then use that army and the troops ashore as extra marines or as marines. Because it seems to be one of the... There's a debate as to how many marines they have on their ships. Again, this is another point against them having... Them using slaves. Because... Nicest way, if you consider the amount of people you'd have on the ship who would be slaves and the ratio to soldiers, you would think you would have more soldiers. They're also... the Despite having all the transports they have with them, the warships themselves are laden with supplies in terms of the Carthaginian ships. Whereas the Roman ships, have, even though they have been carrying supplies at the beginning and they don't seem to have been, they've been in the area for a while. They have managed to start a siege. They have managed to carry on with things. They've been there for a few months by the time this happens. So, yeah. It's not good. 
50, after 15 years of war, the war had got bad. And after 15 years of war, Carthage was really, really bad. This is what it looks like roughly from that point onwards. This war has been, it was going, it was a, had been going on for a long, long time. 23, yeah, 23 years long. 23 years. That's eight years past that point. It's past the point at which you're not being good. And they are whomped out. They are really whomped out. At whom? Yeah, at whom this makes sense. If I'm saying I'm Centurion, I command 100 80. Yeah. And there's an Optio as well who commands 40 more, who commands 40 of them. Well, basically, if they're, they're divided into two groups of 40, so you have the Optio, then you have the Centurion who's in charge of you, and unless, of course, you're the first Centurion, in which case you're probably you're in charge of 160, and you have your Optios in charge of 80 because you're the senior, the, 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 the Centurion of the first cohort. Uh, of the um, first cohort. It gets interesting. So anyway, you have most of the soldiers on both sides having been born after the war began. Yes. Most of the soldiers on both sides haven't known a year of a year of no war. Well, here is the interesting thing. They were supposed to be sailing in. The, the plan for the Carthaginians is this. Sail in, deliver the supplies to besieged cities, pick up the soldiers from the besieged cities, sail out, defeat the Roman navy, which presumably had just let you sail in, and then using your new control of the sea, go back on the offensive. Can we all see small problems with this? Just a few small problems. Just a few. So let's talk about the battle. Let us talk about the battle. For starters, We don't think it was the, that the Hanno who commanded is the uh, is no, Hanno is known as the Hanno son of Hannibal. We don't think it that, that it's the same general who was at battles like Arithium and Economus because well he lost and the Carthaginians have a habit of executing generals who lose. This is something also different in Rome. The generals, if they're executed, uh, don't, don't tend to get executed if they lose. They just tend to never get a post again, which sort of makes them less suicidal. And this point is going to come through. Um, now, he was positioned, broadly speaking, on above this island is when he, he he is sort of awaiting above the uh, distant island and their plan is to assemble as said with their fleet of quinca marines and transports and using a following wind and relying on surprise and numbers to do the 45 kilometers into Lavalium, uh before the romans became aware and concentrated their fleet This is, of course, something they've done before. However, and I think, uh, to sort of add, I, my suspicion as to why the warships are laden with supplies as well as the transports, A, it saves money. 
because it means you can use the warships for dual purpose. And B, if you think the transports might get caught, then it guarantees some supplies get through and even more supplies possibly get through. Helpful. Anyway, early March, they arrive. Now, they then have to wait for the wind to be right. This is the thing. You don't just arrive and go, oh, the wind's ready, charge! No, you have to wait for the wind to be right. And the trouble is, if you're doing a surprise attack, what do you not want to do? Hang around within an area where Romans might spot you. And I guess what I'm going to say, the Romans are spotted, uh, the Carthaginian fleet is spotted by Roman scouts. Cadalus, as a result, abandons the blockade, took made sure all his ships had a full complement of soldiers aboard. So he took soldiers from the besieging Roman army, put them aboard the ships, and then they sailed and anchored off the island of Agusa, which is the closest island. That's sort of the northern one, the sort of Levanzo in this picture. And he sits and waits there. While there, he has his ships strip their masts, sails, and any unnecessary equipment to make them the most seaworthy in stormy conditions because the wind was blowing strongly from the west, which suggested the enemy were going to come. The current was running the same way. He knew Hanno was going to come at this point. And so he decided that he would attack into the wind, with the wind blowing on the bow, which is a very, very difficult manoeuvre. But he's been training his fleet for roughly nine months. They've been at sea in operations for nine months. He's confident of them. They're motivated. Hanno is charging towards them. Catalus transfers command because of injuries suffered in, in the siege, to Falto. So Falto is in charge for the battle. The opposing fleets met west of the island of Perusia, which is modern Levanzo. So they don't actually get that far. The Romans don't go that far. The Romans are waiting for the, uh, for the Carthaginians to come to them. They're watching them come, and they're preparing as they're coming, and then they just go, Charge, hello, we're here. There is one suggestion, because quite a lot of anchors, lead anchors, have been found in that area, that perhaps the Roman fleet paused and cut their anchors in order to withdrew, reduce the weight they carried. I personally am not sure they would do that, but it's certainly a possibility they anchored to hold themselves in position as the Carthaginians were coming towards them. And it would be a quicker maneuver rather than raising them because you just cut them. But maybe they did that. Or maybe they were just chucking them off to try and reduce weight. Romans formed a single line of ships and rowed into the wind towards the Carthaginians. Carthaginians at this point, low, uh, without well, with little choice because they can't really maneuver around the Romans. And remember, they have all sorts of merchant uh, of transport merchant ships with them. They can't do much. They lower their sails and get ready to engage. They just can't do anything else, really. This is what the Roman ships looked like, probably, at this point, it, broadly speaking. Thanks to their vessels only carrying the bare necessities, despite being heavier construction than Carthaginians, they actually are more manoeuvrable and faster in the battle important. The Carthaginians are of course overloaded with everything. Carthaginian crews were inexperienced, were barely trained, some would argue, and certainly not as motivated as their Roman counterparts. But also you have to remember the best soldiers and best crews have, were already commissioned in the various armies already fighting for Carthage around North Africa and in Sicily. 
So this were the people who are left. Whereas the Roman system, <coughs> alternating civilian and military commands, meant they had a pool of people to draw from. The abandonment of the Corvus seems to have been an advantage in this fight as well, because it forced Roman commanders to concentrate on the ram and concentrate on maneuver. Whereas with the Corvus, they had traditionally been able to, let's put it this way, not worry so much about the ram and concentrate on infantry, which was quite a good thing, but was problematic. The Romans managed to sink 50 Carthaginian ships, 20 of them apparently with all hands, and 70 vessels are captured, along with roughly 10,000 personnel. The Romans lose 30 ships sunk and another 50 damaged. So it's 90 to 80. And the 50 damaged, not many of them are really recovered. And let's be honest, of the captured ships, they're quite complicated to get back, so honestly it's probably force neutral in terms of the losses. The Carthaginian fleet uh, was only saved by a direct uh, a, by a change of the wind, which allowed them to flee. They had their sails far easier to put up, whereas the Romans had got rid of everything to make themselves as light as possible. They'd literally focused on making it light. They did the Roman equivalent, the well, the wooden ship equivalent of building a modern supercar. Lightness and cost. Uh, the interesting to note: uh, Hanno returns to Carthage with his fleet and gets crucified. Quite literally, that is how Carthage motivates their generals. They crucify them if they fail. And before anyone starts going Hanno, Hannibal, etc., were they the same family? There, go and look it up. There are lots of them. I'm not sure if they're any same family or if it's just a very common name. It seems to be like the version on, on John Smith. So I'm not 100% sure. Let me just Okay, the five. Carthage also was a smaller city than Rome. Carthage might be further off in North Africa, but not Rome. Or quality in amount. Hmm. Fine. Back in a second. Just have something. Not Foxy this time. Foxy is going to be a problem. What's wrong? Just the fight these freaking sheep hog. Seriously, just leave it for me to lift in the morning. Sorry about that. Sister lifting large heavy object down garden. Me thinking, oh, this will be a case of me getting told off tomorrow because she'll have bad back. 
I've already complained about my back. Me going and quickly grabbing Alpha and putting it to where she wanted it. Sorry about that. So, Mac, the Sharrigans had like three, had like three names, and they all started with H. <laughs> yeah, Carthaginians. Yeah, they they they, they assume interestingly. <laughs> Sending that one now. Now I'll refer to Agent Wardrobe as Angry Wooden Ducks. Yeah, that's what it's gonna be. So, Gondiad the most famous Hannibal is from the Barker family, who were busy in Carthage in Spain at that point. Not quite, but they would soon be. Uh, that ta that that happens mostly. Po they mostly get involved in Spain post-war. Post first Punic War, they, they they do get involved in it a bit, but you know, late it's later that the Carf the uh, uh, Barker family really get involved in that area. And here is the thing: in the... honestly, at that point, if I was the the, the my master going, well, wh why should I fight for you if all if I if I lose? I do my best and I lose. I get killed. That's not going to motivate me to fight for you. That's going to motivate me to surrender to the Romans. Or possibly hand my fleet over to them. In return for citizenship. Night Aaron, your sister should get a wheelbarrow for heavy lifting. There is one in the gar in the garage. I built it. She didn't feel like getting it out because she thought that would be too much an effort. I love the daily. So I'm going to go, are the Romans a case of it not taking 300 years to build maybe? Um. i put this. The Romans have 23 years of war. And I would argue there is a difference between building a navy as in having a force and using it. And building a naval tradition, and I would argue the Romans had, do succeed in building a naval tradition, but it takes a lot longer than twenty-three years of war. Yeah, the, the, basically, if, if I'm a, a, a Carthaginian uh, admiral, what's the point? Or general, what's the point of me fighting? I'm just going to get killed. If I win, yay! But there again, if I win, I still might not get a thing because I could be a victim of the internal politics in Carthage and actually end up wind up dead anyway because I'm now too powerful because I won a battle. Remember, an enemy commander captured by Rome could be used as a human sacrifice in the triumph. Yes, but that's a possibility. Whereas it's a certainty if I go back and have me defeated. Possibility versus something. The other option is make sure the bro fill the crew with people who I trust, and if I get defeated. We're going to we're going elsewhere for uh, uh, friends. So here is what happens after they lose the fights. They do uh, do basically they've lost the battles. New pa a new faction comes to power in Carthage, and they sue for peace. And you get the Treaty of Lutatius, which has a cut to twenty two thirty seven BC, but it's agreed in two forty one BC. No surprising, after they've lost their last remaining territory in Sicily, and they've had this big naval battle, which they've lost, they're kind of upset. Unfortunately, they run straight into the Mercenary War, which is really not a good thing to be part of. And the Mercenary War is not fun for anyone. I mean, it really isn't fun. The mercenary war is is how about it? Or the truceless war is a dispute over the payments of wages owed to twenty thousand foreign soldiers who had fought for Carthage on Sicily during the First Punic War. They combine with roughly seventy thousand Africans um, from Carthage's dependent territories. Who decide to join them, and basically under the generalship of another Hanno, 
they fare poorly. I don't think it's the same Hanno who is, uh, as I said, this Hanno involved in this is executed. Then comes another Hanno. And as a result, Hamlaka Barca comes back. He's a veteran of the campaigns of Sicily. He's given command of the army in, 2040, uh, in 240 BC, becomes supreme commander in 239 BC, and is basically critical in fighting this the, the, the mercenary war. By 237, the rebels have mostly been defeated and the city, their cities brought back under Carthaginian rule. However, this is where you get a sort of issue because at this point, the mutinous soldiers had slaughtered all the Carthaginians in Sardinia. The Carthaginians were going to go back to take Sardinia, but the Roman Senate stated they considered the preparation this force an act of war and demanded Carthage cede Sardinia and Corsica back to them, which is where, to them, which is where you get this 237 BC codicil. So the, actually, Carthage loses those territories because of the Mercenary War, not the, the First Punic War. Interesting enough, Polybus considered this country to all justice. And it. How do I put this politely? Now. It's kind of like a country going. You know, you have these two parts of your country in rebellion against your government. Hmm. If you send troops, if you send troops to them and to and take them, we will consider that an act of war. Therefore, we will take them over. Can't think when that has also happened, or recently has happened, has it? Interesting enough, I programmed this in, of course, weeks, months ago. I'd worked out I was going to do this because it's the tenth of March, and I've been looking at what March twenty twenty two was going to be for since November. So, um, yeah, fun times, shameless, but fun times. As a result of this, the Carthaginians start pushing stuff in Iberia. Basically, Hamakabaka decides that Carthage needs to strengthen its economic emerging base if it were ever to again confront Rome, which he thought was likely. And Hamilcar takes the army, which he led to victory in the Mercenary War, and which had been planning to go to Sardinia, and carves out a state in Iberia, which gives Carthage silver mines, Agricultural wealth, manpower, mil uh, uh, shipyards, and territorial depth to stand up to Rome, in theory, by having control of the Iberian Peninsula. Or a large chunk of it. Hamilcar rules as a viceroy, succeeded by his son in law, Hasrudal, Hasrudal in his early uh, 220s, and then his son, Hannibal, in 221 BC. The Ebro Treaty is agreed in 226 BC, which agrees with Rome, specifies that the Ebro River is the northern boundary of the Carthaginian sphere of influence. Then, of course, the lovely Romans turn up and decide they're going to make a separate treaty with the city of Saguntum, which is well to the south of it. And so history begins. That leads to the Second Punic War, because Hannibal besieges and captures Sagadum in 219 BC. And so in spring 218 BC, Rome declares war on Carthage. And this is the war, of course, which produces 
one of the greatest generals of all time. Scipio Africanus, who is really, really cool. And this is the Basil Littleheart book about him. Um, not always so great on the history. Very, very cool on the interpretation. And some great analysis, interesting analysis in that. There's also at the certain point the First Macedonian War, and the Third Punic War then happens later on, but uh, yeah. This is what happens when you end up at war with the Romans. And if you think about it, it all happens because the Carthaginians decide to go close to the Roman border and react more quickly than the Romans do, and give the Romans an opportunity to go for avarice, because they're motivated by greed as well. You also have the problem of Maritime Empire, which is spread all the way around, versus what is a solid lump in many ways of empire in terms of Rome. Um. Dragon, they build a fleet. That's not a navy tradition, but a fleet fueled by army traditions. Pretty much. Hmm. I don't know, the third period of glass on the design is only five, I think. I don't I, I understand where that joke's coming from, but no. That's right. Why does your love advisor love Carthage so much? Um, which one? I have had a couple of advisors who would really love Carthage. Um, Andrew Lambert quite liked them, and a fair number of other powers who were his, were his um, metier. There is a Carthage, Rome, Messina, and the Syracuse in upstate New York, and Troy, Albania, Albany, Ithaca, Ithaca, and Athens. Even the current. Hmm. What happens when you have a large Italian and uh, Greek population turn up and start settling places, and then someone decides they're going to be clever? Is there a European town name you can't find somewhere in the States? Kovrak. I've looked. There will be a long patrol which will come out on Saturday for this stream, and there will be a long patrol that will come out for tomorrow's stream, uh, tomorrow's live, on Monday. I guess you meant Lam Lambert comes around us because he does talk about Carthage. Yeah, and this is another one. Is anyone surprised that I do a lot of Carthage and uh, Carthaginian Roman history when I that was my, when Andrew was my PhD supervisor? Anyone told him to pick an area? Actually, no. If you want to tell him to pick an area and focus on it. I want to be in the room, and I want to be seated comfortably with popcorn. Uh, Drac would like to be there as well, and another guy called James Smith would certainly want to be in there. I'm fairly sure quite a few of my colleagues would want to be there. Um, yeah, the, the, I am basically going through, there is not a single one of his PhD students who wouldn't like to be in that room. We'll just be there with popcorn going, yes, you tell him. Go on, tell him. We'll just, um... Sit and take pictures and uh, live stream this. And we will, trust me, we will live stream it. Probably giggling the whole time, but we'll live stream it. I haven't recorded Long Patrol for tonight on tomorrow uh, for Saturday uh, Long Patrol yet, but I will record it um, probably Saturday because tomorrow my mom's off to a doctor's appointment. Anyway, questions. I did set aside. I, I thought this would be roughly slide wise 
would come at roughly two and a half hours long, but I thought there would be questions. A lot of them. So that's why I allocated roughly 30 minutes of questions. And then it's food time. And then, uh, vision. Early Americans saw themselves as the New Roman Republic, so that made Greek and Roman naming part names popular. Although we ha did have a Palaemra and a Cairo too. Ah, the dreams. The dreams. Out of it? Hmm. Ah, let's see. <sighs> that pretty guesses us the tactics. It comes down to it's an individual ship fight. It's not going to be the tactics are not going to be mass fleets. The Romans start off in line. I wouldn't be surprised if. The Carthaginians are more bunched up. Remember, the Carthaginians are trying to sail as fast as they can for Lyonum and to get there. So the odds are they're strung out. The odds are they're having to bunch themselves up and try and get themselves back into some sort of order. So the odds are they're not in line as well. And that's a problem because being in line is an advantage if you're a ram. Uh, you're all presenting your rams to the opponent and you haven't got any of your other ships in the way. This is why you like to form up in lines. Having other ships in the way is problematic. But also you have to remember that if you're ramming, you don't... And if we go back to this picture... If you have a scenario where the ram is likely hitting another ram, then something has gone wrong, because the whole point is you're supposed to ram by trying to, at an angle, usually sort of like this, hit another ship. Broadside on sounds good, but that's actually a good way to get your ship stuck in. Going in at a slightly off the uh, broadside seems to be more better from some of the accounts I've read. And so it's sort of at a slight angle. Rather than like that, you want to go in from that or that. But you don't want to go in sort of dead straight because it'll create a bigger hole, but also make it easier for you to withdraw. Easier being the important thing. If you're going to capture a ship, then that's a different procedure. Then what you have to do is try and ram the oars. So you pull your oars in and you ram it through their oars to try and cut down their mobility. Then you get close, that's when the corvus goes across or any other form of methods you have of pulling the ships together and your marines go over. But it, ramming is, it's all focused in on that, that very narrow angle of weapon use on this terms of the ram. So, that's your tactics. Your tactics are individual. You pick out your ship, which is going to be the one in closest line to you, and you go for it. And you try and manoeuvre so you are able to do that, basically. And you can do quite a lot of turning with more oars, because you can have the oarsman of one side be sort of pushing the water back, you know, doing that, versus the other oars doing that. 
So you can have versus Okay, she a question number two. Is Barcelona named after the Barca family? I honestly don't know. I'd like to believe it is, but I have never checked. I'd like to believe the Barca family were involved in that one, but I'm not sure. It would be nice to believe they are. Nice to everyone. Am I right if Denmark straight goes beyond 10 minutes, the danger for the Germans increases? Yes. Vintage car history. Can you imagine a Nemi ship actually being built for war? Ooh. Let's see if I can find a decent picture. The thing is, as massive as the Nemi ships are, and they are Caligula's floating pleasure palaces, there is, and I will quote, uh, point out again, the Ptolemaic, uh, the Ptolemaic forties. Um, which are known as the Tessaracantes, a large catamaran galley which had 40. You know, that, that's what sort of, that, that had 40 or a number of rows on each column of oars. Are four, or they had 40 rows on each column. And as I was explaining earlier, they are quite literally mahusive. There is a lot of speculation as to how big they were and what they're, uh, and you know how how they were laid out. But there is, if I can get it up, this image of it on Wikipedia. So I'm allowed to use it. My always my theory. Now, it may or may not be like that, but having forty oars, a uh, forty oarsmen in each column, <whistles> it was massive. In order to launch it, they actually had to do dry dock construction, and they had to construct them in a huge trench, basically. They had 4,000 oarsmen, 2,000 per hull, and therefore 1,000 per side. And as said earlier, they would carry nearly 3,000 soldiers and then other personnel, which would be why they would have crews of roughly 8,000. Now, they aren't quite as big as the Nemi ships. They are not quite as big as the Nemi ships, but they're not exactly small. And... In the nicest way, I don't consider these warships. I consider them floating present status ships because you can't. There's no. Yes, they have rams on the front, but in the nicest way. How are you going to ram another ship with this? Basically, it's a mobile artillery platform at this point. You know, there's debates as to whether or not she had 400 sailors, 4,000 rowers, and nearly, uh, you know, roughly 3,000 uh, 3, soldiers plus other personnel. Could well be up to 8,000. It's just. It's colossal. This is this is a status piece. It's not actually used as a warship. It's a status piece. Although, frankly, if it did turn up in a battle, oh, good lord, everyone would be looking at it going, can we sink that? Can we try? Mm-hmm. I have questions on uh, tips for being uh, for doing a book review, but that might be about a, a bit turned off topic. Hmm, maybe at the end.
Um, Targus, any record of using incendiaries in Punic Wars and Naval Battles? I think there were certain... They were trying and looking at it, but also you have to remember that It's not like Greek fire, which comes later, and various other things which are developed over time. In Sindri, incendiaries, they are used mostly with artillery, and fire is a risk to yourself in a wooden ship. And VCH, ah yes, I know, and I do have some notes coming for you on your book writing. I just haven't sent them back to you because I've been, sw I've been talking with all the people's marking because everyone else keeps getting sick. It turns out the best material for sensor invisibility turns out to be wood. Hmm. That wouldn't surprise me. Don't recount, the battle this battle was before proliferation naval torture and artillery? To an extent, yes. It's still got it's got some rudimentary artillery involved, but it's not really the era when they have the most of it. Hey, Vision, for UAD, the best year to mo the model battle of real plate is 1932. First year you get diesel power. For British cruisers, I went with 7-inch uh, and 9-inch guns. Look more realistic. It's interesting how too pinky looking. Generally, I have been wondering whether there might be some teamwork between two or three ships to force an enemy to compromise their position against at least one. You can do that in a scenario where you have enough ships. But remember, in this battle, technically the Cardassian, uh, the Carthaginians outnumber the Romans. They have 250 to 200. And so technically the Carthaginians could try that, but they're not in a formation to do so. And that's the problem. They can't use their extra ships. What they should probably have done is if they were in a line, they could use their extended wings to come out and come around and sort of attack and work their way in, but they don't get into that formation. So instead, they're bunched up, and the Roman line managed to extend around. Vision, you look like a Boba Fett teaching Tuscans to ride speed bi uh, speeder bikes, but I'll explain it as well in rowing. Hmm, cool. DCH, never say if I can get it up in mixed company. Hmm. That's actually a real crime that Jones destroyed the pledge of yachts that the Mussolini recover from eyes. That is, it was a really interesting bit of maritime history that we've lost. Hmm. Egyptians had a Cameron fortress with several rams to break harbor chains. Yeah, that wasn't this big, the big 40s. They had a few short, or they had smaller ones than that for that. Something around, would one of these Nemi ships be a faster ship than the fully rigged ship of the line? No. No. The fully rigged ship of the line would be faster. And a lot smaller and a lot more powerful considering its cannon. Do we know possible size specs? We do know possible size specs for this one. And remember, it is called a Tessara Contreras. And our source estimates that the length was 280 cubits, or roughly 420 feet, that's 130 meters. Beam, 38 cubits, or 57 feet, that's 17 meters. Uh, per catamaran hull. We think if Casson is correct. And Casson is. I'm trying to remember his first name from this point. I'm going to have. Uh... Lionel Casson. He was an American who specialized in these things. 
Um, do, 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 do. When I say he was, I think he's still, he's still alive. No, he's dead. He died in 2009. There are so many good historians in 2009, 2010. Anyway, uh, Lionel Cohen, uh, Lionel Casson, um, one of the world's specialists in Hellenic ship design as a historian worked this all out and suggested it was you know it was all grouped together uh height from waterline to tip of stern 53 cubits that's 24.2 meters or 79.5 feet height from waterline to tip of prow 48 cubits or 72 feet 22 meters uh length of steering oars they had four of those each was 30 cubits long uh that's 45 feet or 14 meters Longest rowing oars were 38 cubits, 57 feet, that's 17 meters. And well, oarsmen 4,000, officers' ratings, deckhands 400, marines 2,850, and could carry other personnel as well. So you have a crew roughly in the region of 7,250, well, 7,250 to uh, 8,000. This is basically a mobile intimidation system. That's what it's for. Intimidating the living of you. And it works well. Good luck, Rowan Cash. Aaron, sounds a bit like the giant ships the drones had on the late level time in the 30s. I think it's pretty much a similar idea. It's a status uh, piece. That's right. Is it fair to say we'll never see a na we'll never see a navy reach the size of the uh, RNUSN reach in the end of World War Two? Nope. In the nicest way, people keep uh, have been saying for the last few years that we wars of the future will only be wars we choose to get involved in. And they'll never be started by anyone else, and uh, no war will ever happen in Europe again because we've got too much interconnection and too much trade and too much good relations going on. Yeah, that's all twaddle. So let's leave it to one side, okay? Yes, we could. If wars happen, then fleets could grow massive. There could well be fleets of that size again, if they need to be. If they need to be, they will be. Mon lessons from the Rome Carthage comics. You've only lost when you decide you've lost. And that's it. If you decide you haven't lost and you keep on fighting, then you haven't lost. And that's the difference between Rome and Carthage, because there are many times. Rome should lose. There are many times, according to the rules of war, as Carthage understands them, Rome should sue for peace. But Rome doesn't give in. Carthage doesn't give in either. But Carthage doesn't last as long as Rome does. They run out of energy first. And that's it. It comes down to logistics. It comes down to infrastructure. Let's put it this way. There's also the advantage of the Carthaginians is that they start out with this wonderful infrastructure. But the trouble is, the Romans are able to account for that. And that infrastructure, if it's not upgraded and it's not improved itself, becomes a problem for the uh, for the Carthaginians, which is why. Barker goes and builds that empire in the Iberian Peninsula. Goes and builds it so they can build new infrastructure. They can build the shipyards and they need to build bigger ships.
Now, Trevor, can you model an armored cruiser armed with eight nine point two inch guns in four turrets and six uh, to eight twin five inch secondary turrets and two torpedo launchers? A super Luca. Mm, I might do. I'm, I'm considering ideas for UAD for the rest of the month, so I'll put that on my list of potentials. But it depends what I'm going to teach with that kind of thing. What kind of a lesson I'm going for. So anyway, how would the US battle fleet look if the Panama Canal had been built to modern Neo Panama standards? Fatter. More traditionally shaped. Their ships would have been more like. rather than. they'd have been. So they'd be far more looking. their hulls would look far more King George V than Iowa. in shaping. I'm showing 130 meters, just unlike the like OHP. Yep. That's everyone. Thank you for sending me that. I will read it, I suppose, at some point. So far, I've been avoiding the AO quite well. Contrast, supposedly there is still a giant library left in Heraclium that was buried by Vesuvius. There are docks there that were carbonized. Do you think we should look for it or wait for technology to improve? Um. Mm, that's always a hard one because there's always a, the, the thing of how long is it, how much is it deteriorating where it is versus how much can we actually, how good is our technology to recover it so we can actually get it. If we don't have the technology to recover anything, then we should probably leave it where it is because we might develop it. But if we have technology we think we can recover it and deteriorating, let's go for it. I find that hard to believe due to sustainability long term. That they scale them down in peacetime. They always do that. But you're saying, would they build them up in wartime if they need to? Yes. Would they add their numbers? Yes. Would they all be crewed? Probably not. They'd be uncrewed ships as well. Numbers are doable if you need them. You build them. If you go, well, you know, the enemy, oh, look, the enemy's building hundreds of ships, but, oh, I don't have the infrastructure. Well, then you surrender and you don't fight a war. But if you're actually fighting a war and actually going to fight it, then you go, oh, build, build hundreds of ships, which means I better build the infrastructure for them. And that's also the trouble. The Romans do invest quite heavily in infrastructure. How much would it? How long would it t take to build a, a quinquereen? The materials of manas. Well, they broadly speaking weigh in at roughly hundred tons. So hmm. they are not 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 light, but not exactly the most heavy of option of, of options. How long would it take to build? There seems to be a debate about that one, but basically, the adv the answer I can give you is that the Romans decide they will never achieve what they need to do achieve unless they build the fleet in 243 BC, and the fleet goes to sea in 242 BC. So they churn out 200 quincamarines in a little under a year. So they can build 200 in less than 12 months. I don't think they build a ship, I, don't, I think it probably takes longer than a, bit, a month to build a ship, but I don't think it takes the full, the full term to build a single ship. Vision. What if the Romans had steam pan but not gunpowder? Steam rams? Some theorize Rome had too many slaves and working power to spark it in the Industrial Revolution. 
Well, as I've said earlier, slaves weren't the power for these ships. There is debate over it, but again, you start looking at numbers and you go, wow. That's a lot of people. You know, we were talking about the Quinker Marines. They have 300, so that's, uh, 300 um, oarsmen aboard. Out of a crew of 100 or 450 in total, of which 30 odd are probably sailors. Uh, only 120 soldiers. Um, those soldiers won't be awake all the time. And then you've got battle damage, you've got the fighting. Uh, how many soldiers are you prepared to send in your boarding parties? Yeah, making that, having them as slaves is not a good idea. Industrial revolutions take a lot more than just will and desire. They take spark of intelligence, luck in terms of figuring something out. I'm not saying people are smarter in modern era than they were then. I'm saying what happens is every idea builds on other ideas. I need a lot of ideas to get from the Roman period to the Industrial Revolution. A lot of ideas. So, yeah, and a lot of metallurgy. But they do have a bit of an Industrial Revolution because they certainly move from bronze to steel. Well, of a kind. They had, I don't know if point out, they did have steam, steam toys, but there's a difference between having a toy which can use steam and actually being able to productively harness the high power, the pressured steam you need. And as Donald Garland was right, fuel metallurgy, yeah. I don't think we'd ever see fleet or air force or tank force numbers compared to World War II. It's because of the resources cost and the capability of modern equipment. No, I think we could. I can see a pathway for it. It's not an unpopular opinion. Because most forces these days are focused on an efficient elite instead of a mass mobilized formation. But I could see a scenario where the, the threat of nuclear weapons ruled them out. And where you ended up with mass mobilized forces with thousands upon thousands of vehicles. And yes, it would not be easy, and it would not be quick. You'd be looking at a long time building it up, but yeah, I can see it happening. Especially if you have a more aggressive conventional, cult, aggressively con confrontational, convention, uh, aggressively conventionally confrontational um, Cold War sort of scenario going on for a few years beforehand. Doc, have you been able to fit 14-inch guns on the dreadnought like you speculated? Yes. It took a little bit of work and using the shift key to move things around, but yes. And a slightly f a fatter dreadnought. Not much, though. Gorosalsi, again, you so you're basically going right then, so we... Uh, the trouble is... You cannot consider them the equivalent of names. So, a 15,000 ton ship these days is the equivalent of, let's be honest, a cruiser, a heavy cruiser, if not a, a, a battle cruiser at some extent, in the, that sort of period. So, you're looking at those, those, they might be called destroyers, but they're cruiser equivalents, so those are the numbers you have to compare them to. And then you work your way down. You can't go across from name to name because 
there is this ongoing cycle within the armed forces and the world where you pick the name, where you're growing the name of the thing below to replace the thing above because it's more politically correct. Like APCs, armed personnel carriers, are slowly developing closer and closer to tanks. We look at some of them. They are slowly getting closer and closer to the idea of almost a tank. Especially some of the Israeli ones. Neymar, etc. And Merkava reports can carry troops. So it's... You cannot compare it necessarily on a like-for-like -like basis. In terms of nameology. But you can probably get it similarity in terms of displacement number and proportions as force. No, I haven't seen a Facebook message yet. I will have a check for it. Mm -hmm. Populations today are much higher, and the traditional populations of the places are not either colonies or completely erosive right, autocracy yet. Possibly good to be more numerous. Hmm. True. How would you design a modern ship purpose built for a mission to be sent back to interdependent wars? You can send back crew as well. Hmm. An LHD star vessel with a dock to land with a dock to allow land heavy equipment ashore if I need it for operations ashore. Um, four double five inch guns. Four double fifty seven millimeters. So I can shred any fleet that I need to. Uh, VLS with missile with Tomahawk cruise missiles, and of course because it's an LHD would carry the lot of need to carry. Why do I take F thirty five? Probably not. I take F thirty five might as well. But also a, lo a whole load of drones and helicopters. Using that, I would take over a small country known as uh, Great Britain. Oh yeah, the whole thing would be coal powered. Because I can get coal in the Napoleonic era. Which solves my fuel needs. I'm sure someone tried it and then the slaves decided they didn't want to be slaves. Um, well, that is basically the problem. There are all sorts of issues with trying to maintain that or that control that ship using slaves. Likewise, where the, where were uh, where were Greco-Romans to the medieval Renaissance of Europe? Mm. They're actually behind. This is one of those things. There is a conceit called the Dark Ages. And I do not like that as a phraseology because it's basically a romanticization of A, the Greco Roman period, and B, a romanticization of the Enlightenment. In that, in the nicest way, the lives of people throughout those periods were short, horrible, and nasty. The vast majority of people. It's the idea pre the Industrial Revolution of anyone having anyone but the richest of the rich having a nice life 
and even them, uh, for them it wasn't exactly an easy life, is wrong. We are very lucky, but we have to be very careful when we look back to not imagine our, our own scenarios in the past. So far, I've got four questions from my stream. I'll look forward to that one. Vision. Mass mobilized ground forces seem like it may be key in current war in Ukraine. Also, some limiting the ability of both air forces to fly effectively. They are certainly have an impact. They certainly are having an impact. They had an industrial revolution. They had a flour milling complex in Spain, many water powered mills, and in Turkey, a, a hydro -sto powered stone cutting industry. Yeah, they had. It wasn't a. It was an industrial revolution based on coal. It was industrial a revolution based on hydro power, which hangs around for quite a while. Not nuclear, but a lot of reserves for like 50 years. Well, nuclear power is lovely, but do you want to maintain nuclear power for 50 like years? Because let's be honest, a reactor is one of those things you have to maintain very carefully. It's the, the, the sort of the history of um, the, the naming of periods is interesting. No, I didn't miss it, Night 6031. I just didn't feel like reading out the joke at that point. I was just trying to work out why, uh, what the answer would be, and trying to come up with a fun answer in my head. So, uh, the joke he's written is, um, You missed this, been watching your videos. Why are battleships killer whales and battle cruisers basking sharks? Well, I'd say because battle crews are supposed to hoover up the ocean, and battleships are supposed to take are supposed to hunt in packs and take things everything down. Then I kind of also the Dark Age is a very Eurocentric view. There are so many terribly Eurocentric views in history. Uh, it just gets disturbing sometimes. Some of the stuff you deal with and international relations, etc. It's just yeah. <laughs> And what, what's also funny, and I probably, this will get me into trouble is when I say this, the people who sometimes expound these ideas are some of the people who would so, would instinctually claim, and probably would be in any other basis, the least, uh, you know, the least obsessed with, uh, the uh, most trying to look at people from the inside out. But they have these incredibly Eurocentric views based on history and the world and who's doing what. Coal power chips need way less tech maintenance. Mm hmm. That's true, Seneca. And you can, uh, and let's be honest. You can design a ship to be very efficient in its usage of coal. And it means, if it's coal powered, if I go ashore after becoming my emperor king of, you know, Britain and ruling the world from it, I can still control it because I control access to its coal supplies. Also, don't you want some broadside guns able to use black powder? Nah. Because I can design a cartridge system which can use black powder. Or a variation of it. That can be built in the time period. I can design everything to be built with materials of time and take the things back I need to build them. Right then, what have we got coming up? 
Uh, da -da -da -da. Well, next week we have the Glorious Heritage class. And I said I would say this because I'm going to be asking this again on Sunday. But if you would like the live on the 20th of March to be the Glorious Heritage class and a look at the Systems Commonwealth, rather than a normal brew ships, I will do that. But it has to. It's up to all of you if you'd like it to be that way. So if you'd like a sci-fi themed brew ships for the 20th of March. I'm happy to do that, but you have to sort of basically say, okay. Because it's a bit off the normal topic list, but it's quite cool. And brew ships this week will include this book. This book and just arrived today, so I'm going to be reading it late tonight to make sure I have it ready because it's a bit late. This book, fresh off the press from Random Sword, and there's some more books coming apparently soon as well. So, um, who knows what will actually? Well, it could be more than that, and then in there. Glorious Heritage Class, hmm. aka Andromeda. Right. There were breech loading guns on the mirrors. Hmm. There were some. Though. There are talking. I'm for the sci fi brew ships. Hmm. There are breech loading guns around, but it's a, making them mostly of bronze because you can make bronze a lot tougher than you can make iron at certain points, but iron is far more cheap. You can produce a lot, a far more quantity, a far more quantity in iron, and also iron is far more consistent than bronze. So you can theoretically produce a bronze breech loading gun, but it's more expensive, and there's a higher failure rate of the exams you build. They they work or they don't. Whereas with the iron ones, you can build them more consistently. All right, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. Um, apologies again for the confusion of Numidians and Nubians at the beginning. But there is... Oh, now I remember where I got it from. I do remember now. Oh, I will do a video about that to explain it all. Anyway, thank you, everyone, and thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and uh, take care. I haven't. So, no, stress for you to have a look at the local computer recycler. I know my local computer recycler. They are very nice people. But, um, to be fair for them, most of the really nice stuff they can uh, they get, they tend to take themselves and build into their own gaming machines, which they're using. I'll try and nick a gaming machine on them, possibly. All right. Take care, Aunt. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Congratulations on your to your new G uh, girlfriend, and have fun with uh, and have fun. Have you have fun from this uh, Zini, the oldie sage? Right. Take care, John Shea. Thank you, Abzaski. Thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, Bijan, Dunrakan, Hamada, Night Six Three Three One, Desert Foxo. Very specific. Do you know about books about the Celtic Atlantic North Sea ships from the, uh, the Romans account of later on? Yes, Simon Elliot has all sorts. Uh, Simon Elliot's books uh, on the naval history of Great Britain and the Roman Navy have all sorts of stuff about them, including the Romans copying the design. Take care, Dan Ragama. Thank you, Melaga. Thank you, Dick Richards. Thank you, Colin Cameron, Vision. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dan Freeman, Sean Mack, and Stafford for doing the lovely admining duty this evening. It's been very kind of you. And thank you, everyone. Hope you had fun and hope you enjoyed it.
Azteca. Uh, oh, and don't forget, coming up in May, if you enjoyed this, is going to be the Battle of Cape Economus. And as I said, this is as uh, from the, the records and materials as we have access to currently, and as I've, all, I've read, is the largest battle ever involving 290,000 personnel fighting at sea. It, you know, it, it, it's colossal. It takes place in 256 BC. We aren't really sure which day of the month, day of the year it is. We know it basically takes place in the early summer, late spring, early summer, which is why I picked to do it in May. And yeah, it's cool. And it is a absolutely colossal battle. An absolutely colossal battle. Take care, everyone. Hope you enjoyed and have fun.